Mystery writers like to say there's no such thing as a perfect murder. But maybe they're wrong. Toronto. In this Sikh neighborhood, you can speak Punjabi all day. Young people marry according to their parents' wishes. People find each other jobs at businesses, like this bakery, which is why in 1988, the city's favorite rye bread is baked by Sikhs. Someone like Ravi Bethal. Ravi is a hardworking, fun-loving 22-year-old. Everybody likes him. He's got no known enemies. But on the night of August 2nd, Ravi does not come home from work. For 24 hours, no one has any idea where he could be. His family grows more worried. Shortly after 6 p.m., the phone rings. A man whispers, your son is dead. That's when police are called in. In true crime, investigation and conviction may take years. But every detective knows that the crucial clue is always there, somewhere in the first 72 hours. Twenty-four hours after an anonymous caller says that Ravi Bethal is dead, police assign someone special to the case. I was born in India. I'm a Sikh. Uh, I have certain language skills, and that's the reason I was brought into the investigation. Detective Sidhu is now a senior intelligence officer, but in 1988, when this case broke, Sidhu was a young detective trying to find out why Ravi Bethal was missing. Like many Sikh families, Ravi and his wife have come together through an arranged marriage. And there have been problems. Ravi's father points an accusing finger at his son's pregnant wife. He says if anything happened to Ravi, his in-laws in Chicago are behind it. He hints it has something to do with the dowry, but refuses to say more. Next stop, the bakery where Ravi Bethal was last seen. Sidhu and his partner locate Ravi's best friend. Though he's reluctant to get Ravi into trouble, detectives manage to convince him that talking to them is the best way to help his friend. Friend says Ravi got an unexpected phone call around 11.45 p.m. Though his shift wasn't over for hours, he said this couldn't wait. So around midnight, Ravi flipped him a Mickey and asked him to sign out for him. That was the last he'd seen Ravi. Reluctantly, he adds one important fact. The call was from a woman. The night he went missing, he did tell a friend that he was going, he was on his way to see his girlfriend. A girlfriend and a pregnant wife? Detectives tracked down another co-worker Ravi talked to the night he disappeared. It was common knowledge that, that he had a girlfriend. A matter of fact, he had more than one girlfriend. She says Ravi was popular with women in the bakery, but there is one in particular that she remembers. About a year ago, Ravi seemed to have his eye on a woman named Ravana. When detectives ask her if this was more than a workplace flirtation, she tells them about the day her boss asked her to get boxes from the upstairs storeroom. <laughs> Detectives wonder if Ravana is the girlfriend Ravi went to see the night he disappeared. 
but the co-worker doesn't know. All she knows is that Ravana quit the bakery more than a year ago and moved out of town with her husband. The next day, Detective Sidhu gets his first private interview with Ravi's wife. She was very humble, very simple lady. They only had been married for a short while and uh, very upset and uh, that's all, you know, just like a, a, a normal wife who would be upset. Sidhu wants to find out if she knows anything about a girlfriend, but he wants to be tactful in case Ravi still shows up. Ravi's wife reveals that a few months ago, things got so bad that she secretly packed her bag and went to live with her family in the States. But Sidhu can't get her to say why she left or why she agreed to come home. As the 72-hour mark approaches, police discover Ravi's car abandoned 10 minutes from the bakery. The car has no plates and has been vandalized. After 72 hours, we were, we were um, uh, a lot more concerned uh, that, that he hadn't been, hasn't been found yet. Shortly after this, a witness claims he saw someone run from Ravi's car to a second car the night Ravi disappeared. Detectives wonder whether the running man was Ravi or the person responsible for his disappearance. But it was too dark for the witness to get a good description of the man or the driver. Ravi's father now comes up with a new theory. He tells Detective Sidhu about his son's run-in with members of the Babar Khalsa. Babur Khalsa is a militant Sikh organization founded in India, and they have cells in Canada. The Babar Khalsa, it's rumored, coerce workers to contribute towards an independent Sikh homeland. Ravi's father says his son not only refused to give them money, but threatened to write letters exposing their members to the Indian embassy. As they're following this up, police in a Toronto suburb get a disturbing call to come to a wooded area. Homicide detective Paul Carroll vividly recalls arriving at the scene. It was in 1988, and uh, we'd received a call that uh, initially it was thought to be a, a baby in a bag was the initial uh, radio call. When we arrived, we discovered that it was in fact uh, burned uh, human remains of, a, of an adult. The skull shows signs of severe trauma from a heavy object. The orbital bone uh, around the eye had been fractured, and there was a severe fracture in this part of the uh, the jaw and the skull as well, which was consistent with a pretty severe blow, or several. It's clearly a homicide, and someone is trying to hide the victim's identity. There was a few uh, items located around the body which eventually uh, assisted us in making a positive identification. Uh, there was a Seiko man's watch which led us to believe it was in fact a male. There was a uh, necklace, a uh, gold uh, pendant. Detective Sidhu and Carol, now a team, undertake the delicate task of showing the jewelry to Ravi's father. The pendant was actually uh, customized um, and made by their missing person's father, who was a jeweler. Ravi! That was identified by the father as he having had made that for his son. Detectives now know Ravi Bethal was murdered and that the killer or killers have taken great pains to cover it up. <sighs> the 
The night he went missing, Robbie Bethal told his friend at the bakery he was off to see his girlfriend. Now that it's a homicide, detectives press Robbie's wife for answers. Does she know about Robbie having a girlfriend? Our investigation showed us that the victim and his, his wife uh, had, had been having some marital problems. Painfully, she recalls cleaning up after a party the month before Robbie disappeared. He returned three hours later, and he'd been drinking. She actually confronted him, and he confided at that point in her with her that he had, in fact, been at this woman's residence. So it was confirmed that he was having an affair or had had an affair. He said he'd been in love before he was married, and he wasn't going to give her up. Detectives ask if she knows the woman's name. She says the woman's name is Vavana, the same woman who Ravi reportedly had an affair with at the bakery. But when police interview Ravana, she denies it all. They'd never been involved romantically. She didn't have any idea what happened to him, that she knew nothing, basically. I moved away and uh, from that area of Toronto and hadn't seen him in uh, several months. She was uh, quite firm and uh, didn't appear to be nervous and her answers were simple and straight. Detectives also questioned Ravana's husband, Sukhvinder Shergil, about Ravi's disappearance. Shergil says he only met Ravi once at a dance for bakery employees more than a year ago. Something doesn't add up. Sidhu and Carol apply for a wiretap. When it's turned down for lack of evidence, detectives have no choice but to close the investigation into Ravi Bethal's murder. Months later, Ravi's widow and newborn daughter move back to her family in Chicago. For six long years, there are no further leads. It looks like someone is going to get away with the perfect murder. Until one day, police receive word that a Sikh man has new information relevant to the case. The man is currently in jail for sexual assault and slated to be deported at the end of his prison term. He's willing to exchange his information for permission to immigrate to Canada. In his videotaped testimony, he says he was a friend of Sukhvinder Shergil. They'd been police officers together back in the Punjab. On the night of August 2nd, 1988, he received a phone call from his friend Shergil. He tried to find out on the phone what had happened, but he wouldn't tell him. He just asked him to come over and asked him to come over in a hurry. He arrived there and he entered the house and he noticed a lot of blood. He'd known that Shergil's marriage to Ravana was in trouble. Shergil told him that he had surprised his wife and her boyfriend and the boyfriend had tried to attack him. He said he killed him in self-defense. He advises that he was afraid and didn't want to help, but he was threatened by his friend and uh, that uh, he needed him to help, and if he didn't help him, that he would kill him. As a former police officer, Shergill figured it would throw the investigators off the trail to abandon the dead man's car near the bakery and put the body somewhere else. And around two, they found a wooded area off a side road. Once at a site that they had chosen, our victim was uh, doused with gasoline and uh, was set ablaze.
The informant is hoping his cooperation will let him stay in Canada. The question for detectives? Is a single word of his story true? Detectives need to find something to verify the informant's story. Really, the only evidence that we had was the statement of uh, our jailhouse informant. So we had to take a close look at that and make sure that, that what we were getting was, was uh, on the up and up. They rewind the tape to the part where the informant mentions the burning of Ravi's body around 2 a.m. They know that a melted watch had been found by the charred body. The watch is forensically dissected to help determine the time of death. We wanted to see if we could tell uh, if the watch had stopped at a particular time. We took the watch uh, to the engineer and, uh, and opened the watch up. We found that the workings of the watch had actually stopped at uh, between 2.11 and 2.12 in the morning on the 2nd of August. This corroborates the 2 a.m. time mentioned by the informant. Police pay a 5 a.m. visit to Sukhvinder Shergil, now divorced from Ravana. And I translated uh, his rights um, for counsel, that he doesn't have to make a statement, and he stated that he didn't wish to make any statement. Ravana is also arrested. As she watches the informant's video, she breaks down. She admits she lied to police and that she did have an affair with Ravi when they worked at the bakery. But she broke it off when she became pregnant with her husband's child. She wanted a fresh start. She quit the bakery, and she and her husband moved out to the suburbs. But Ravi tracked her down. He started calling. He said he couldn't live without her. Finally, she told him it was over. What he wanted just wasn't possible. They were both married. She had two young children. He had a child on the way, but still, she says, he wouldn't let go. Then he did something truly bizarre. Unbeknown to her, he taped one of their phone calls where he got her to talk about intimate details of their affair. And then he gave the tape to Shergill. Maybe he wanted them to break up, you know, by giving handing over tapes to Shergill, they'll have a conflict, they'll break up, and then he'll marry her, something like that, you know. But it, it was very odd for us to, to see that handing over tapes. But Ravi's plan backfired. Shergill was incensed. He insisted his wife lure Ravi out to the house. She was threatened by Shergill that if she didn't place the call, that he would leave her. Wanting to believe Shergill when he said he just wanted to scare Ravi, she was waiting for him as he came through the door. that uh, was in the living room 
at the time of the murder and that it had a huge blood stain on the back. And she tells us a story of how she was ordered to cut the blood-stained portion of the back of the couch out and re-sew another piece of fabric onto it. Though Shergill, the ex-cop, thought he had successfully covered up Ravi's murder, he had foolishly kept the couch all these years. When police went with the search warrant, they, they located a couch. There were blood drops were still around the sofa, and that's what police recovered. The DNA of tiny specks of blood they find on the couch proves to be Ravi's. Ravi Bethal found himself in the oldest trap of all, a love triangle. This burning obsession for another man's wife consumed not only him, but everyone around him. You can look at the parents, the lost, um, a, a, a grown-up, healthy young man. You look at the wife, she lost a husband. And then you look at the child who doesn't have a father. It's, it's a real tragedy. Because he helped solve the case, the informant is acquitted of his role in the murder and given landed immigrant status after his release from jail. Ravana receives two years as an accessory to murder. And Sukhvinder Shergill, who tried to commit the perfect murder, is convicted and sentenced to life. The stories on 72 Hours are true. The detectives and forensic scientists are the ones who actually worked on the case. Life in the city can be dangerous, especially if you live on the street. How to keep safe. Finding a place to sleep is the biggest challenge. Look for well-lit, well-trafficked areas. This ought to do it. But tonight, on the streets of Toronto, there is no safe place. A homeless man lies dying. This isn't the first time. It's the third in a series of murders that have terrorized the homeless in Toronto. Three down. How many more to go? In true crime, Investigation and conviction may take years. But every detective knows that the crucial clue is always there, somewhere in the first 72 hours. Bright lights, big city. For some people, it's exciting. For the homeless, it's a battleground where you're at the mercy of the very streets you call home. On this balmy night in June 2001, one homeless man has paid the ultimate price. The 911 call came in just after midnight. Two hours later, Detective Jeff McGuire arrives at the scene. First step is to liaise with the detectives there just to ensure the scene is properly protected. So we have an exchange of information with them and give them some direction and receive information. You still take a breath and go in before you have a look because it's, it's not a pretty sight at all. The uniformed officers have already cordoned off the street and begun interviewing bystanders. On a major downtown intersection like this one, they expect to find a witness. So far, nothing. I can't believe that midnight uh, on a Sunday night on Bay Street in the, the biggest city in Canada, not one person saw this happen. McGuire needs to know the victim's identity. 
In the bus shelter, no belongings to search. In the victim's pockets, no wallet. But the investigator knows homeless people often hide their valuables so they won't be ripped off. In the victim's sock, they find a wallet containing a bus pass and an ID. Now the victim has a name, Mr. Andrew Walker. First step in any investigation, understand your victim. Who he was might tell police who killed him. Andrew Walker made this downtown corner his home for months. People in the area saw him there every day. It was just somebody who was there. He was part of my world. He was part of my neighborhood. As I would go to work, I would see him sitting on his favorite bench. And he would watch you as you went by. And if you acknowledged him, he would acknowledge you. And I think that's why a number of people called him Santa Claus. He had that kind of open, jolly face. But he was a solitary character. I noticed that he would speak to an imaginary person. From the people who worked in the area, McGuire has learned that he was a gentleman, a loner, possibly a mental patient. Police need to find his family to notify them of his death. My partner contacted uh, a number of different social agencies, and through welfare, they, he was able to determine that he had collected uh, one emergency welfare check on his application. There was a name and address. Um, I believe it might have just been a town and a name of uh, relatives in New Brunswick. Andrew Walker was born in New Brunswick. He was very close to his mother, and when she fell ill, he stayed by her side until she died. He wanted to be a teacher, went to college but never finished. After her death nine years ago, he disappeared. His family never heard from him again. Andrew Walker is the third homeless man murdered in as many months. His death galvanizes the public. If even a harmless, gentle soul like Andrew is at risk, should everyone be afraid? certainly raised concerns um, in our minds initially and certainly in the media uh, picked it up and, and, and ran pretty heavy with the potential that there was somebody out running around just aimlessly killing homeless people. It was something that we had to consider, but the only way to do that is to conduct your investigation of your murder. From the autopsy, police learned that the cause of death is trauma to the head with a blunt object, consistent with the cobblestone, and a deep slash wound to the neck consistent with a knife. There are no defensive wounds on the victim, suggesting he was asleep when attacked. Blood tests revealed that he had no alcohol or drugs in his system, which is unusual for a street person. So is Walker's rap sheet. He doesn't have one. Not an intoxicated ticket, not anything, um, which is, uh, I think, highly unusual for somebody to be able to live on the streets and just basically never get in anybody else's way generally end up, uh, somebody complains about him, like he's in front of my building or he's sleeping in my garage. That just never happened with this guy. With such a clean rap sheet, no evidence of robbery or struggle at the scene, it's becoming increasingly difficult to see what motive anyone could have had for murder. McGuire can reach only one conclusion. This was a random killing. It's a troubling way to begin a homicide investigation. Motive is, is a, such a big key to an investigation because it leads you in a direction. It's the random killing, which makes it even more difficult and gives you more concern as an investigator because, again, it takes away any starting point from you. All McGuire has to go on is whatever is collected in the first 24 hours at the crime scene. He needs to find a lead before this brutal killer murders again. A random, apparently motiveless murder of a homeless man on the streets of Toronto. 
at the crime scene. Everything from cigarette butts to garbage in nearby containers to the murder weapon itself have been bagged and tagged for forensic testing, hoping something will yield that crucial physical link between the victim and his killer. Ideally, we're looking for evidence of the suspect being in this area, or hanging out in this area, or living in this area, and to, uh, to put him together with the victim. IDENT officers find fingerprints on the bus shelter. At a busy corner like this, they could be anyone's, but police need to cast a wide net. Some small bit of evidence that seems irrelevant now could be crucial later. Since the shelter is located just outside a complex of government buildings, there are dozens of security cameras trained on the area. McGuire hopes that one of these cameras got a picture of the killer. The day after the murder, surveillance tapes come in. Police know that a young man made a 911 call about the crime at 12.02 a.m. and that the victim died a few minutes later. The video shows a man walking through an exterior passageway around one of the government buildings at 12.05. If the killer struck just before midnight, then hurried away, he'd have ended up in these shots at just that time. So this could be the killer. But the footage doesn't show the man's face clearly enough to make a positive ID. For 22 hours, investigators have been combing the crime scene for evidence. Near the bus shelter, McGuire sees a row of cobblestones. One's clearly missing. It appears that the killer took the trouble to dig out a heavy cobblestone to bludgeon his victim to death. Nearby, an officer finds a discarded liquor bag, which is sent into the forensic center and tested by IDENT officer Larry Hicks. Hicks finds a clear print on the bag. We examined the fingerprint and compared it to the fingerprint that I found inside the bus shelter uh, the previous day, and the fingerprints belong to the same person and the hit came back to a known offender. That person is identified on the police database as Daryl Rogney, also known as Daryl Callan, a man with a long string of convictions for violent crimes. He's an alcoholic vagrant with no fixed address. Police will have to act fast before he moves on. For one of the officers who worked at the crime scene, the name Daryl sparks a memory. An onlooker she interviewed on the night of the murder identified himself as Daryl Callan, one of the two names that came up on police records. Officer Chuck remembers him clearly. There was one particular party in the group who was just very boisterous, uh, very loud, laughing, jovial. Um, not the behavior that you would expect to see at a crime scene. His explanation for being in the area was that he had uh, spent his day drinking over at Queen's Park. I asked him about uh, a red droplet uh, that he, a red stain droplet that he had on the sleeve of, of his Adidas jacket. Since he was cooperating, she asked to see what he had in his knapsack, just to prove to her that he wasn't carrying a knife. And the only request he made was that uh, I'd be discreet about it because uh, he admitted to being a cross-dresser and that he had articles in the bags that he felt would embarrass him. He was so unusual. He made, he made the hairs on my neck stand up. He was just too weird and too bizarre, but I mean, there was nothing, there was nothing else there than just a feeling. 
You can't build a case on a feeling. McGuire needs more than Feidenchuk's hunch. He keeps in touch with the officers investigating the two other homeless killings to see if there's any connection. Daryl Rogney may be the key. He puts out a police bulletin to find Rogney and have him picked up. Daryl Rogney's prison record shows a conviction for manslaughter 18 years ago. It also shows that he was released from jail just before Andrew Walker's murder. Five days after the murder, police finally locate him. But he looks different. He shaved his head. When they bring Rogney in for questioning, he's difficult and evasive, pretending he's drunk and out of it. McGuire recognizes this kind of slippery behavior. He guesses that Rogney changed his appearance to disguise himself from police. Interesting but not enough to make him a suspect. Until McGuire spots what appears to be blood on his boot. Rogney's rap sheet tells police he's a dangerous man. With his fingerprints at the crime scene, blood on his boots, and his attempt at disguise, McGuire feels he has enough evidence to arrest him. He's counting on forensics to prove him right. In crime fiction, the boot would give him the evidence he needs. But this is true crime, and as McGuire will find out, things don't wrap up quite so neatly. Daryl Rogney, the prime suspect in the murder of Andrew Walker, is in jail. Detective McGuire has sent his boots to forensic biologist Cecilia Hagerman hoping through DNA analysis to finally have solid physical evidence. There was a small amount of blood found on those boots. However, no DNA profile was obtained from that small amount of blood. A blow to McGuire's case. But Dr. Hagerman suggests a new line of investigation. There was a significant amount of bleeding at the scene, and that would indicate to me that the best thing to look at would be the clothing of the suspect, because there would be a good chance of transfer of blood from the victim to the suspect. And he didn't have his backpack when he was arrested or any of, or some of his other clothing was missing as well. So I asked him, I said, look, you know, you're gonna be in jail for a while. Where's your stuff, we'll get it. And uh, his comments were that, don't worry, you'll never find it. It's, uh, I, I've got to put away. In detention, Rodney boasts to his cellmate that he doesn't care if they put him in a hell hole like the Don Jail because from the window, he can keep an eye on the few possessions he owns. The windows of the Don Jail look out in a ravine where homeless people live in makeshift shelters. What Rogney doesn't know is that his cellmate is an undercover detective. Deep in the bushes, we located a uh plastic garbage bag, which when torn open contained a black backpack. The backpack holds all the items yeah. that the officer at the scene of the crime had seen and cataloged in her notes, including the jacket, which she suspected was spattered with blood. This find is good news for investigators who are running short of evidence. But when Dr. Hagerman examines the blood on the backpack and jacket, it turns out to be Rogney's blood not the victims. As they prepare for trial, McGuire's worried. The case isn't strong enough to win a conviction. All they need is one piece of physical evidence that ties Rogney to the murder. And they still don't have it. Looking for a new perspective, McGuire returns to the crime scene. What has he missed? He starts with what he knows about the night of the murder, then tries to reconstruct the rest of it. Walker was fast asleep. Rogney was drinking in a nearby park. What happened next? Rogney is an angry, hyper drunk, but Walker was sleeping so peacefully, so deeply, he wouldn't wake up. For some reason, that must have pushed Rogney over the edge. As 
Maguire retraces Rogney's path, he struggles to dig out one of the other cobblestones. It's harder than he thought. It suddenly dawns on Maguire that the killer might have left traces of his skin on the murder weapon. I reminded her, you know, Cecilia, you promised. I said, if we got to the point where this guy's going to walk out and it was the end of the line and the, the bottom of the list of priorities, you told me you'd look at the rock. The blood on this rock, after DNA typing, was the victim's blood. That was no surprise. The question was whether or not the person who used this rock to bludgeon the victim also left his or her DNA on that rock in the form of perhaps skin cells. And the preliminary hearing was running from a Monday to a Friday. And if we got past the Friday and uh, we didn't have a match, then the gate would have opened and uh, the accused and I would have walked out of court together. The rock was quite dirty. There was lots of soil on it. Um, when we did the DNA analysis of those swabs from the sides of the rock, the initial analysis did not work. We had to dilute the sample down in order to get the profile out. So we had what were called inhibitors to the process. Um, but in this case, we were able to dilute them out and we were able to get a full DNA profile. The skin cells found on the rock match Rogney's DNA profile, which puts the murder weapon in his hand. Midweek, a call comes in from Dr. Hagerman. I answered the phone and uh, I think her exact words were, Jesus, I hate it when the cops are right. Finally, McGuire has got the evidence to nail Rogney. Both Rogney's fingerprints and the skin cells on the rock were collected in the first 72 hours after the crime. Cornered, destined for a long prison sentence, Rogney wants to talk. He went on to tell a story about a man and a fight broke out and this victim had grabbed him in a headlock and beat him up and uh, when he finished the story I just said you know like I just don't believe it I just none of it fit anything we knew about the victim I mean what he did was just uh, very very horrific I don't doubt for a moment that uh, from what I know of his history and uh, from his conver my conversations with him that uh, uh, some form of alcohol abuse has obviously played a big part in his life and he, uh, he's got uh, extremely violent tendencies that he just simply has no control over. Police have since solved the two other homeless murders. Each was committed by a different killer. Rogney is sentenced to 25 years in prison. But why did he kill this man? A drunken rage doesn't answer the question. It was a random act devoid of rationality. It was what we fear the most, chaos striking in the heart of our ordered, everyday lives. The stories on 72 Hours are true. The detectives and forensic scientists are the ones who actually worked on the case. The names of the victims are fictitious. The names of the convicted are real. It's often said, murder is not for the faint of heart, but it can be. A quiet day in Clinton, Indiana. In the small community hospital, caring nurses mend bodies and save lives. But lately, the team has been losing the battle there has been an alarming rise in the number of sudden, unexplained deaths, triple the normal rate. Bad luck? Bad medicine? Sheer malpractice? Or among the angels of mercy, an angel of death?
true crime, investigation and conviction may take years. But every detective knows that the crucial clue is always there, somewhere in the first 72 hours. In the administrative offices of Clinton General Hospital, a meeting behind closed doors. Head nurse Timmons, just back from maternity leave, has uncovered some alarming statistics. In her absence, patient deaths have skyrocketed. Last year, 51. This year, 167. She can't shake the feeling something is very, very wrong. Her boss calls the police. It was in the summer there of 1994, in which the death rate uh, just jumped tremendously. Uh, patients were dying, uh, sometimes uh, three of them at a time. Nurse Timmons explains to police how she cross-referenced the times of death with the nurse's shifts. Certain nurses tend to be on the job more often when people die. Still, it could be anybody, a doctor, a technician, an orderly. She describes how she checked data from separate reports, always with the same chilling result and the same cause of death, sudden heart failure. Nurse Timmons can't believe it herself, but she knows that numbers don't lie. Clinton police begin an immediate investigation. You collect your evidence, your key evidence, your, your physical evidence, and you only have one shot to get that evidence. And if you miss it, uh, it's probably gone forever. Investigators move quickly to seize ECG reports. The electrocardiogram charts of patients who died of heart failure. Nurse Valquez was on duty for 49 of the sudden deaths. Under questioning, she tells police they are missing something obvious. The intensive care unit treats patients who are very sick and very old. They often have fatal illnesses which go undiagnosed. In her opinion, the rising death rate can be explained by the aging population. Investigators continue to collect evidence. They seize the red box containing drugs used to revive victims of heart failure. Nurse Barton was on duty for 47 of the sudden deaths. She also mentions that patients are old and sick, but remembers some exceptions. In particular, a local resident, Adrian B., who arrived accompanied by her niece, Melanie. She complained about shortness of breath, but otherwise seemed to be in good health. She was advised to stay overnight for observation. The next morning, Nurse Barton was surprised to learn the woman had died of cardiac arrest. The investigator feels he's getting good cooperation, but he's no closer to the truth. Everything goes through your head as to the possibilities to why the death rate might have increased. Uh, had there been uh, a virus or something like that, maybe entered the hospital causing these deaths. Things don't always sometimes seem to be what they may be. If a person comes in for a broken arm and dies uh, a day or so later, uh, just from a broken arm, something doesn't add up. 
Nurse Majors was on duty for 76 of the sudden deaths. But he's not working at the hospital anymore. He's taken a job at his parents' flower shop. Police discover Nurse Majors was recently suspended and had his nursing license revoked. Nurse Majors believes he's being set up as a scapegoat. Majors is openly gay. Clinton is a very conservative town. He won't talk to police on advice of his lawyer. But police talk to his co-workers and learn that Nurse Majors always took the longest shifts and the toughest cases. When situations threatened to get out of hand, he took control. Patients and families praised him for being compassionate and caring. Media reports of a police investigation at the hospital cause fear and disbelief in the community. <laughs> I know uh, Mary Alderson. I know David Abernathy. I know uh, James Blackburn. I know Ines Kogan. It was unbelievable that such a small community, something like this could happen right at our little hospital. Town residents, hospital staff, and relatives of the victims all demand a quick answer. But after the first 72 hours, the deaths remain a complete mystery. Confronted with 167 deaths, Bud Alcron is struggling with a question most unusual in the world of detectives. Was this a crime? And that was a major hurdle for us, and that uh, we had uh, patients who had died, but was it natural death or was it homicide? After six months of investigation, local police are stalled. They have made no progress in finding out what caused the sudden deaths of 167 patients at Clinton General. State Police Detective Bud Alcron selects 16 of the most suspicious deaths. Perhaps the dead can tell their own tales. We exhume bodies from the graves and have them all topsy and uh, let the medical doctors try to find uh, a cause of death. Families of the deceased agree to the gruesome task. They're desperate for the truth. Cause of death on the original certificates, heart attack. The autopsies tell a different story. When the doctors, the pathologists examined the, the bodies, uh, they would say that, you know, this was not the death by a heart attack. The heart's in good condition. Healthy hearts do not stop beating without a reason. This is a case of murder, mass murder. Among the angels of mercy walks an angel of death. For hospital administrators, the news is a bombshell. They order the hospital closed. All the nurses, including Nurse Timmons, who triggered the investigation, are suddenly without a job. Their lives are in shambles. Most leave town. One stays to fight. Nurse Majors wants the world to know neither he nor his co-workers are to blame. His lawyer appeals to the media. The people really who work at uh, the hospital are absolutely convinced that no one was murdered at that hospital. No one murdered. But Alcron is determined to prove it is murder. He turns to world-renowned heart specialist, Dr. Eric Pristowski. Armed with the ECG files seized in the hospital, the doctor searches for the real cause of death. What I decided to do was to take each case and very carefully sort of start to take notes and document what was going on. He's looking for a common pattern in the heart rhythms, which would explain so many sudden cardiac arrests. And a lot is riding on the right answer. I always said benefit of the doubt to the nurse to prove it otherwise, because what do I know? I don't want 
to be the one to put an innocent person behind bars because I built a false case. While waiting for Dr. Prostowski's answer, Detective Alcron makes his next move. Look into the psychological profile of nurses who kill. And many of these people in hospital settings who do kill are playing God. These individuals are into power and control and get off on the mastery of other individuals. They have the power to decide who lives, who dies. Committing serial murder without being caught is the ultimate power game. The urge to kill can lie dormant for years until something acts as a trigger. Could be anything from stress to uh, job dissatisfaction to something that's happening in their life that's causing them more stress. There is a relationship between stress and, and acting out. In light of the psychological profile, the detective revisits what he already knows about the nurses and gets a new read on nurse majors. There had been an incident in the staff room, some black humor, poking fun at majors. Innocent enough, but the normally affable majors didn't find it very funny. It was reported to us, yes, that there was a personality change in him. Uh, more aggressiveness on his part, uh, more domineerance on his part, uh, uh, mood swings, things like that. Majors had a good reason to be under stress. He had just lost his longtime partner. He'd started visiting truck stops late at night, cruising strangers, living on the edge. Majors does fit the psychological profile, and he becomes the prime suspect. After months of analysis, while working at home late one night, the heart specialist has a breakthrough. I walked out of the library and came in and, uh, to the kitchen and said, uh, the son of a bitch killed him with potassium. Potassium chloride is commonly used by hospitals. In small doses, it controls an irregular heartbeat. But its use is highly restricted because it can be lethal. In large doses, it is used to execute murderers on death row. It's the only chemical that can cause a perfectly healthy heart to flatline. But Alcron has a murder weapon and a suspect. The detective obtains a search warrant for Major's home. In Major's garage, he finds nine empty vials of potassium chloride. In Major's car, two more. A key find, but they could have been placed there by anyone. The detective sends the vials to Toronto, to the most advanced fingerprint lab in the world. In a vacuum chamber, the vials are bombarded with charged particles to reveal even the faintest fingerprint. The result? Inconclusive. Alcron is disappointed, but not surprised. I know it's easily portrayed in television shows where fingerprints are always available. I think in my 31 years of police work, I've only had two cases where I've been able to get fingerprints. Even as the police investigation tightens around him, Orville Majors is taking action to regain his nursing license. Detective Alcron is convinced that he has his man. But how is he going to prove it? Detective Alcron has discovered the diabolical method of murder for many of the unexplained deaths at Clinton Hospital. He suspects Nurse Orville Majors is the serial killer. 
but he still wonders why Majors might have wanted to murder these old patients. As we interviewed his friends, uh, we did learn that he uh, did not like old people. He felt that they were a burden on society. He made derogatory comments that they, you know, ought to be done away with. Detective Alcron uncovers a deep, dark secret in Major's past. As a young man, Major's had to take care of an elderly relative, day after day, until she passed away. Major's hated it, and his anger never died. Still, Alcron needs incriminating evidence to link Major's to the potassium vials found in his car. Alcron finds out that each vial of this lethal chemical is restricted to a single needle use only. Multiple needle punctures would indicate foul play. Once again, the detective turns to science. Toolmark analyst Mark Keisler knows his evidence will be key in court. I found multiple sticks in what was termed single-dose potassium chloride bottles. I found eight needle puncture sites in one potassium chloride bottle. These are only to be used one time. Here he was in possession of, of potassium bottles that had been used multiple times, which is wrong. It was not uh, according to their, their practice. And so it was just one more piece of uh, circumstantial evidence that we needed. Nearly three years after the beginning of the investigation, Detective Alcron arrests Orville Majors on seven charges of murder. Majors maintains his innocence, claiming the bottles of potassium have been planted. Alcron hopes he hasn't made a huge mistake. The prosecution has a murder weapon, motive, and opportunity, but no eyewitness. Detective worries that circumstantial evidence alone may not be enough for a jury. Could they think that a nurse could be killing people? Can the jury comprehend that? It's not like a, a 38 revolver in your hand with a bullet and the, and the decedent who's just been shot. Uh, how do you show that that 38 caliber uh, weapon is a bottle of potassium chloride? And so yeah, our odds uh, again, were against us going into the trial that uh, we didn't think it would win. For the families and the community, a lot is riding on the outcome of the trial. The day before closing arguments, Detective Alcron gets a call from Melanie B. A news report of the trial has jogged her memory of something she saw in the emergency room. Her eyewitness account could tip the balance for a jury. On a summer afternoon, her Aunt Adrian called, complaining of chest pain. Melanie rushed her to the hospital. Adrian was given a bed so she could rest comfortably for the night. Melanie tells Detective Alcron she left the hospital greatly relieved. The next morning, Melanie found her aunt in good spirits. Her aunt had slept peacefully and was eager to go home. A nurse confirmed that Melanie's aunt was going to be released later that day. Melanie went to arrange her aunt's discharge. Soon after, Orville Majors came for her. He said that her aunt had taken a turn for the worse. Melanie was shocked. She didn't question why Majors gave her aunt an injection. Melanie saw Majors kiss her aunt and heard him murmur, It's all right, Pumpkin. 
Everything is going to be all right. Moments later, her aunt was dead. Although still deeply grieving, Melanie is compelled to relive her aunt's death on the witness stand. These people were betrayed. They went into a hospital to get well, and they ended up dying. And they were murdered there. The jury found Orville Majors guilty on six counts of murder. Although he chose not to testify, Majors maintained his innocence. He showed no emotion when the verdict was read. The sentence, 360 years in prison for the man everyone called the Angel of Death. The stories on 72 Hours are true. The detectives and forensic scientists are the ones who actually worked on the case. The names of the victims are fictitious. The names of the convicted are real. No one believes in ghosts until they encounter one. Almont, Ontario, a tranquil farming community. Claim to fame, birthplace of the man who invented basketball. A place with a community spirit epitomized by volunteer fire brigade captain, Art Brown. Everybody knows your brother, your sister, your father, your aunt, your uncle, your grandparents, your great-grandparents, and everybody cares about each other. But in the summer of 2002, the peace of this trusting community is suddenly shattered. Someone is setting fires. Someone who strikes without being seen. An arsonist who will become known as the ghost. In true crime, investigation and conviction may take years. But every detective knows that the crucial clue is always there, somewhere in the first 72 hours. July 3rd, 2002. Earl and Marilyn Snedden are closing up their barn for the evening, never imagining their night is just beginning. The first fire was discovered about 7.30 in the evening. So then we rushed over with hoses and pails and stuff and called the fire department. The Almont Volunteer Fire Brigade answers the call. In living rooms throughout the community, fire radios crackle out the location. The Snedden farm just outside of town. The wall of a barn is smoldering and could catch fire at any moment. Fortunately, the volunteers will put it out before it spreads. In the barn, Fire Chief Art Brown finds a road flare, what any car owner might carry to light up an accident scene at night. It's also the perfect tool for an arsonist, because a road flare is like a long burning match. You light them and it gives you 20 minutes before they're completely burnt. So maybe from the time he, he set them, it's giving them time to get away. After the sun goes down, under the cover of darkness, at the very same barn, Two o'clock in the morning, a uh, couple of truck drivers stopped and started banging on the door and got the dog shouting at us. And we get up out of bed and look out the window and we see a, about a 60-foot blaze. Unless you've experienced, I don't think you really know what it feels like to look out your window and see a fire like that so close to your house. When I left my house, I just came onto the highway and I could see the glow in the sky. I guess it's the biggest terror I've ever felt. You just sort of feel kind of numb because there isn't anything you can really do except stand there and watch. The men fighting this fire are all local heroes. 
No matter what's going on in their personal lives, they show up. Every man has earned a handle. Scarface Rollins was scorched in a car fire. Macho Man Mackenzie once punched his way through a burning wall. Smiley Edwards keeps smiling no matter what. Retired fireman Gibby Drummond once pulled Art Brown from a burning building. After five hours, the firefighters and the farmers admit defeat and start looking for answers. They knew it was ours the first time, and uh, we pretty well figured it had to be the second time. The arsonist's assault on Almont isn't over. It's just beginning. Seventy-two hours after the first fire, three buildings are charred rubble and local police have yet to uncover a single suspect. He must be dealing with the ghosts because nobody seems to see anything. If they, if they did see something, they didn't realize they'd seen something. People were very nervous. They were, especially farmers, they were scared uh, to leave home. To an insurance adjuster, these smoldering timbers are property damage. But to a farmer, the loss goes deeper. Barns are essential for a farmer's livestock, livelihood, and the health of the entire community. Farmers begin locking doors and boarding up windows. The trusting community is changing. You hate it to become that paranoid and that suspicious, but that's really what the whole community became before the summer was over. The ghost continues to strike, unseen. The firefighters respond to call after call. We worked all day and then we get a call about 10 or 11 o'clock at night and we're out all night fighting this fire and they had to go back to their regular jobs the next day. I got one stretch here at 39 hours without, without any sleep, eh? so you're just going on adrenaline. Eh? So it, it, it took a toll. Always one step behind the fire setter. The men are dangerously exhausted, but they know they have to stay focused if they are to defeat the arsonist and save their community. Somehow, Art Brown and his volunteers keep going, and so does the ghost. Earl Snedden is horrified to see smoke coming out of his second barn, a cattle barn. But we still don't know why, why he picked on us or whether it was just because the building was so close to the road and an old building that was easy to get started. He tries to fight the fire alone. I was trying to ask my 65-year-old uh, legs to move like I was still 20 and uh, they couldn't do it and so my hamstring got pulled and my leg let me collapse to the pavement. I couldn't hardly move because of the hamstring and trying to get, to get the fire out and Somehow we managed to hop over the fence and we got it under control. During the first three weeks of July, Almont farmers endure 10 major barn fires. Realizing they can't catch the arsonist alone, local police call for help. It arrives on July 25th, a regional task force headed by Detective Gary Doherty. We connected uh, fires number one through five, six, and seven because what we were finding is that they were occurring primarily in the evening, primarily in a very tight radius. Uh, we were recovering some evidence of road flares. The targets are all old barns accessible by road. None are near where people live. A pattern is emerging in the ghosts' movements. The frustration was, why can't somebody see them? I mean, why aren't we getting information uh, coming in that that would identify a vehicle, that would identify a person. As tension and fear increases in the community, the arsonist does something no one expects. He changes his pattern. August 4th. Not a barn, but a house on the edge of town. 
a house owned by a longtime Almont resident, Jimmy Grace. A passerby spots smoke. We're called out to the Grace Spire, and I can uh, tell you on my arrival, uh, I was worried. I looked at this uh, farmhouse and I said, this is a new ball game. A new game played where people live and where people can die. The ghost has just raised the stakes. In the town of Almont, Ontario, an arsonist known as the ghost has just tried and failed to burn down a home on the edge of town. However, when Detective Doherty learns that the house is uninhabited, he realizes that the ghost has targeted the place intentionally. And that tells him something very important. That property had been abandoned for 40 years. So the only person who would have the knowledge that that was abandoned was someone local. Inside the house, Doherty recovers a large number of flares. Not burnt out as at previous fires, but pristine specimens. Doherty sees that they are not the common commercial variety available to car owners. Only professional emergency crews have access to this type of flare. And so we had to take a look at this from the perspective this way. Are we dealing with a firefighter or are we dealing with a police officer? The revelation that the arsonist may be very close to home perhaps even a member of his fire brigade, is particularly difficult for Fire Chief Art Brown. Detective Doherty offers Art Brown a way to find out if the ghost is a police officer or a fireman. He will put marked flares in police cars if Art Brown will do the same in his fire trucks. Art Brown hates to sneak around, hates to deceive men he holds in the highest respect, but it's the only way to rule them out. He was more than willing to assist us, somewhat shocked that we were taking a look at, it, at his department, but tempered by the fact that we were doing the same thing with ours. Detective Doherty doesn't rely on the flares alone. He turns to behavioral profiler Jim Van Allen to understand the mind of the ghost. I believe that there was something missing out of this individual's life and the setting of the fires replaced that need for excitement that this individual had. And that would translate to somebody who was overly enthusiastic, somebody who appeared uh, overly inquisitive, somebody who demonstrated those risk-taking behaviors. They have a need to see the uh, damage that they've committed and for some of them, they tend to involve themselves in the investigation as well. As the investigation continues, so do the fires. August 26th, on the outskirts of Almont, a jogger notices a smoking hay bale. She spots a red SUV. And then she finds a flare she immediately calls police, who take it to the fire chief. Two of the officers came in, and, and they I knew just when they walked into my office, the look on their face, that something is wrong here. And do I want to hear what they're going to say? And uh, we have good news, and we get bad news. Good news, it is, it is a Merrick Flair. The bad news, it came out of your vehicles. Oh, you've got to hit me over the head with a sled's end. Art Brown has to discreetly investigate all his men and create a profile for each so that Doherty can compare them to the profile of the arsonist. It's hard for me to not be able to tell my fellow firefighters what is going on. And they were getting frustrated and uh, so it was hard on them too. Fifteen fires in eight weeks. No end in sight. And still no suspect. He was able to strike and he just could do it so fast and get away that, um, that nobody could seem to catch him. That was the frustrating part. The community was adamant that they could not understand why we hadn't caught this individual. And the media put pressure on us by asking the same question, why can't we catch him? 
Police get an urgent call from someone claiming to have important new information. It's retired firefighter Gibby Drummond. Gibby thinks he might have seen the ghost just two days ago. As he put flowers on his mother's grave, he saw a truck loaded with loud teens. Later, he realized that the teens drove past him just after the start of a fire at the Gleason farm, one of the last places set ablaze. Drummond insists, I didn't see them put a torch to it, but I would swear on a stack of Bibles. Seems pretty damn suspicious to me. But Doherty doesn't buy Gibby's story. If kids had been committing these fires, we would have known after fire number one, because kids, although they have this code that they think exists that they never tell the police, they can't help but talk and tell someone. Gibby thinks the investigators are handling things all wrong. We gotta work together on this. We're a team, he says. We have to catch these guys before they kill somebody. But Doherty now has questions about Gibby Drummond himself. There were 50-some odd volunteers that we had conversations with every day about the fires. And no one was animated, no one was upset, no one went sideways on us, no one went to nuclear, if you will. But it's Mr. Drummond on a rant that we have to catch this individual. That just was just not right. It did not sit well with any of us. An angry citizen impatient with the police? Or is Gibby Drummond trying to tell them something else? After a curious encounter with retired firefighter Gibby Drummond, Detective Doherty asks himself, could he be a possible suspect? He certainly satisfied our big three. He's a current volunteer, uh, access to flares, and certainly matches a number, if not a vast majority, of the behavioral profile. But when he outlines his suspicions to Art Brown, the fire chief is positive he's pointing the finger at the wrong man. I say, I've known him for over 40 years. I've uh, worked with him, uh, fought fires with him. He got a bit excited at the time, but that's just, just Gibby, because he, he, he got an adrenaline rush out of of fighting, and he was really, really great, great at his job. Not just great at his job. He once saved Art Brown's life. I went right through the roof, and I went right to the neck, and he just came down with that big hand, and he just grabbed me by the shoulder and pulled me back, pulled me right up in one shot, and he still doesn't know how he done it. Heroism aside, there's another reason that Art Brown is convinced that Gibby could not be the ghost. Five years ago, a terrible accident left him permanently injured. Like the pain was so bad, it, like his, his stomach would actually turn from the, from the pain. And, he, and they started giving him medication, and he was on so much medication. Gibby is still haunted by that night. Up a ladder with an ax. Up a ladder in full gear to protect him from the searing heat. And at the top, a window. Behind the window, a young couple. He swings his axe and strikes the glass. Explosion. He's falling. The young couple perishes in the flames. Gibby's body lies shattered on the ground. detective begins to reconsider his suspicions about Drummond. You had to be physically uh, able to go to some of the locations where we had flares recovered. Mr. Drummond, Gib Drummond, was physically incapable of, of doing this. Nevertheless, Gibby Drummond, the prime suspect, is kept under 24-hour police surveillance. Well, one of the nights that we have him under surveillance, a fire call comes in, unrelated. He goes down the street like a jackrabbit. So, contrary to what the community believed and even his family, 
he was not as physically incapable as he was letting everyone, leading everyone to believe. Everything points to Drummond, but that's not the same thing as proof, not even close. Because frankly, and it's terrible to say, if we were going to successfully uh, resolve this investigation and catch this person, we needed to catch him in the act, and we needed more fires. After 10 days of surveillance, on September 16th, police followed Drummond down a side road. Gibby Drummond, the hero, the victim, the prime suspect. For all the circumstantial evidence, for all the psychological profiling, the investigators do not know for certain Gibby Drummond is the ghost. Until now. In the first 72 hours of the investigation, police found a burnt out flare. But it took 10 weeks to connect the flares to Gibby Drummond, who was hiding in plain sight all along. They read him as rights in front of his second car, a red SUV. It's a shock to the community, but especially to Art Brown. These guys become part of your family. You know, you share so much together. You know, and it's, it's very hard to accept that someone would do this to to you. Art Brown now realizes what his friend has done and how he did it. Gibby would light the flares, knowing he had time to get back home and wait for the radio call to announce his own fires. Arriving at the scene, Gibby would help out any way he could sharing with his comrades the adrenaline of the moment. It was something he needed, his own mock heroics to compensate for his tragic failure the night the young couple died. In the end, he betrayed everyone he knew. I gotta sh separate my, my profession from my friendship, which is hard. You know, say time heals, but... Uh... When he pleaded guilty, he um, begged forgiveness of the court and his family and firefighters everywhere, but he didn't mention the victims, <clears throat> which he thought he might have. <laughs> Haunted by his own demons, Gibby Drummond had terrorized the people of Almont for the last time. He was charged and pled guilty to eight counts of arson. He remains in prison to this day. The stories on 72 Hours are true. The detectives and forensic scientists are the ones who actually worked on the case. The names of the victims are fictitious. The names of the convicted are real. Dark impulses lurk beneath the surface of all of us. Without warning, they can emerge, unleashing a monster from within. Meadowvale is a peaceful working-class suburb of Toronto, a place to raise a family, where neighbors look out for one another. There's a great park nearby where kids can safely hang out. And in the heart of the park is Lake Aquitaine, named after the famous Scottish lake, which is said to be haunted by the Loch Ness Monster. As darkness falls, the park is particularly inviting for teenagers. But all that changes one balmy spring night.
In true crime, investigation and conviction may take years. But every detective knows that the crucial clue is always there, somewhere in the first 72 hours. April 30th, 1998. Three teenage girls have been questioned by police for hours about attacks on them earlier that night. The series of assaults began with Jennifer and her girlfriend walking home through the park around 8 p.m. We saw this guy on a bike. He didn't really think too much, so we kept walking. Um, and my friend said, turn around, tell me if that guy's following us. So I turn around and I said, oh my gosh, yeah, he is following us. He approached the girls and propositioned them, offering them 20 bucks for sex. When they told him to forget it, he exposed himself and started masturbating in front of them. When I saw him masturbating, I was freaked out. It wasn't funny at all. It was just, it was completely a shock. Martha, the victim of a second assault, reports an even scarier encounter to the police. It was about 11 p.m. She too had been approached by a man on a bicycle who demanded sex for money. She told him to get lost. This got the guy riled. He grabbed her, wouldn't let up. But she was able to break away before he could do any further harm. Martha wasn't the last one assaulted tonight. There's been another victim. But this woman wasn't able to get away. The attack on her escalated to a violent rape. The investigation has been assigned to Detective Blaze Doherty, who's just finished interviewing the latest victim, Rachel. All the, all the girls that we dealt with that evening were between 15 and 17, um, very young and certainly something like this uh, was a traumatic uh, event for them. The oldest girl that I dealt with, 17, she'd been through the most that evening. Uh, the 17-year-old girl uh, had been violently attacked and punched, and during the, the attack, her glasses had been knocked off and smashed. Rachel was brutally raped. Semen samples have been taken from her for potential DNA identification of the attacker. Because the assaults were all committed in a similar way by a young man on a bicycle, Detective Doherty is convinced that the same person committed all three crimes. Police need to act fast. This predator is dangerous, going from flashing to rape in one night. They call on a sketch artist to draw a composite portrait of the offender. She was able to give us a very, very good description, uh, even though it had been, it had been dark out, it was that of a male, he was white, between 19 and 23 years of age, fairly slender build, he was a little bit scruffy appearance. Any situation where there's a serial sex offender at large, then uh, obviously the, the stakes are, are much higher. We have a, an obligation as investigators to, to identify this guy as quickly as possible uh, for the purposes of protecting the community. By the next day, the media have picked up the story and informed Meadowvale residents that there's a rapist on the prowl. The composite sketch of the suspect and a Crime Stoppers tip number are posted. Police dub the predator they're now hunting the Loch Ness Monster. The response from the community is overwhelming. People would call in and say, look, I have a neighbor who looks like this guy, or I know a guy who's, who's got a, a history uh, of this type, and he's someone that you should be looking at. Police have to follow up on every one of these leads. 
They bring in more officers to help, including Detective Rob Shear. I was involved in the canvas, and uh, an area canvas is one of uh, the single most important aspects of an investigation. Virtually every suspect that we encountered could have been a viable uh, culprit for this crime. The descriptions were closely matched. The area was basically a buzz of activity. And the community became very involved in trying to help us catch the person responsible. People are on round the clock alert, watching out for unusual behavior in their neighborhood. 72 hours into the investigation, police are getting a growing list of tips. I know that there are people that took it upon themselves to, to walk around the park, checking people out and making telephone calls to the police if they saw anyone suspicious. I mean, even friends of mine had said, oh, I know a guy that looks like that, and oh, that could be this guy. They say in the world everybody's got a double or a twin. Well, there was a number of people in the Meadowvale area that looked a lot like the composite drawing. Some of these guys were being approached by people that lived around them and said, hey, you, you look like that rapist guy. Initially, when I saw the, the composite drawing, I looked at it and said, okay, this guy is distinctive enough that we're gonna have a fairly small list of suspects. I was wrong. We were up to 312 people who looked like the composite drawing. They are looking for a needle in a haystack, and the haystack keeps getting bigger. Time is running out. Serial sex offenders often strike with perverse regularity. How long do they have before the Loch Ness Monster strikes again? The community of Meadowvale, especially the teenage victims, have been terrorized by a sexual predator. Rachel, the victim of rape, has been devastated. The community is on edge. They see suspects everywhere. Almost two months after the night of sexual frenzy, there have been no further reports of assaults in Meadowvale, but police are very aware the Loch Ness Monster could strike at any time. Uh, no, I... In an effort to narrow their search from over 300 suspects, investigators bring in behavioral profiler Jim Van Allen. His first task is to develop an unknown offender profile. There was an individual who was obviously targeting this one geographic area who was motivated by his sexually deviant needs. He was engaging in uh, acts of exhibitionism to the women. He was uh, uh, making verbal proposals to engage in sexual acts in exchange for money. These weren't angry comments. To me, they reflected uh, an unsophisticated offender, very impulsive and brazen offender. It's believed that only 15% of these people will ever escalate to the more serious hands-on uh, sexual assaults. The impulsive type of behavior exhibited during the incidents strongly suggested to me that this individual would go on and repeat serious sexual offenses and likely continue until he was caught. Police now fear that the Loch Ness Monster could even turn deadly. Investigators learn from Van Allen that the man they're looking for is what's known as a power reassurance rapist, someone who feels powerless in their own life or relationship and who needs to assert themselves against someone weaker. The repeated approaches, even during the same night, sometimes minutes apart, suggested in terms of intelligence or intellect, uh, this person would likely be scored as normal, perhaps slightly below normal, but uh, there was no real sophistication to the crime. 
While this helps police eliminate some of the suspects, behavioral profiling is just one piece of the puzzle. Investigators then consult geographic profiler Brad Moore. The investigators were hoping that I could uh, provide them with an area that they should start to look for the offender and basically his base of operations. His choice of locations to commit his crimes says a lot about the offender. The fact that he chose just these trails um, as opposed to looking for victims on streets or in shopping plazas or, or other locations told me that he was comfortable in this area. A key principle of geographic profiling is what's known as distance decay. The basic premise um, behind distance decay is that people do more things closer to home than they do further from home and businesses use it to decide where to put a new franchise. But it also applies to criminals. Criminals also tend to generally behave according to distance decay. The restaurant one. Sexual predators exhibit certain hunting patterns in their geographic territory. Brad Moore tracks these patterns with the help of a software program, preparing what he calls a Jeopardy surface. It divides the hunting area, or the area of all the crime sites, into 40,000 individual squares, and it assigns a number to it. It takes that grid and assigns elevations based on those numbers and displays it as a Jeopardy surface. And that surface looks very much like a mountain range. The higher you get on the mountain, the more likely it is that the offender lives in that area. If they have a list of persons of interest, they would prioritize those that live closer to the peak first for further follow-up. Remembering it's not an X marks the spot, it doesn't mean that the guy at the top of the list is your bad guy. It, it just means that that is, based on geography, the best guy to start with. With the help of Brad Moore and Jim Van Allen, police are able to eliminate more than two-thirds of the suspects, but that still leaves over a hundred. After police factor in the composite sketch and those people whose alibis don't hold up, they are left with a list of 18 suspects. All of the top 18 looked very close to the uh, composite drawing. Uh, they all lived in the area or worked in the area. They all had uh, criminal histories with us. How can they go from these 18 suspects to one guilty man? The DNA of the semen samples taken from the rape victim could provide the key. The forensic center finally calls in to say that they have a DNA profile of the rapist. It's now nearly three months since the crime, and police need to compare the DNA taken from the semen on the rape victim to the DNA of their suspects. They start with their top four. The first suspect is John B. When the detectives come calling, his girlfriend says he isn't home. From the very beginning, he was one of the, the top four that, that we looked at. He has numerous outstanding warrants and has recently been fired from his job. This individual had been around quite a bit, was very streetwise. Shortly after police left, he calls them, claiming he has just arrived at home. They felt he was lying. The second suspect, Eric R., is a transient who spends a lot of time in the park. He's even been known to sleep there some nights. He has a minor criminal record and no alibi for the night in question. The third suspect, Paul W., has been known to follow girls in the neighborhood. Some girls seem to like him, while others report there's something creepy about him. Police discover that his sister moved out of their family's home after filing a report that he'd molested her. The fourth suspect, Marvin P., had come to police attention based on a Crime Stoppers tip. When police decide to interview him at home, they discover he has moved out of the neighborhood and back in with his ex-girlfriend on the other side of town. Like some of the other suspects, he looks quite different from when he was originally interviewed. 
some of these guys, they, they cut their hair, they, uh, you know, they grew mustaches and beards, um, everything short of the, you know, the Groucho Marx glasses to, to try and convince people that, you know, it's not them. Marvin P. and the three other suspects are brought in for further questioning. Is one of them the rapist? Or is the Loch Ness Monster still out there, about to slip through their net? To solve a brutal rape in the midst of a vibrant community, police have brought in their top four suspects. They need to get samples of their DNA. The first suspect, John B., knows the system well. He doesn't trust police and claims he'll be framed. But detectives convince him that because of his outstanding warrants, it's in his best interests to cooperate. The second suspect, Eric R., feels that giving a DNA sample is an invasion of his privacy. But he reluctantly agrees for fear of appearing guilty. The third suspect, Paul W., realizes it might make him look suspicious, but he adamantly refuses to let police take his DNA. He won't tell them why. The fourth suspect, Marvin P., appears shy but direct. Police have discovered that he was once arrested for robbery and served six months. He readily gives a blood sample for his DNA. The four suspects are released, but since Paul W. was the only one who refused to give a blood sample, investigators put him under surveillance. Uh, deviant sexually motivated offenders really don't stop. If they're feeling that they're under a lot of suspicion or the circumstances in their life changes, it might be easier for them to control their impulses, but they're never really gone. In a matter of days, the lab gets back to police with the DNA analysis. Detective Doherty answered his cell phone, and I could hear part of the conversation coming across the, uh, the telephone and that there had been a match and it was uh, probably one of the happiest days of my life. There's a, a real charge to knowing that you've finally caught the, the person that you've been hunting for the last three months. Police arrest the rapist and bring him down to the station. This is the story he tells. It all started around the time of the breakup with his girlfriend, a period of high stress. This concurs with the profile constructed by Van Allen. It's not unusual at all for these people to wait until some peak period of stress in their life to go out and commit their offenses. And this is a way that they can attempt to rebalance their life and make themselves feel better about themselves. Sex crimes of this nature are all about power and control. Very, uh, very little has to do with actual sex. He's just a person that needed to exert that type of power and control over female victims, and, and that's what made him feel better. After his first pathetic attempt to entice the girls into sex failed, this powerless man became more bold. When Martha came along, he had built up his nerve to attempt a physical attack. By the time Rachel appeared, he had worked himself into a sexual frenzy. Marvin Payne needed to have absolute power, and he found it in rape. Payne thought he could get away with his violent attack but the DNA sample collected from the victim in the first 72 hours gave him away. Half a year later, Payne is convicted of aggravated sexual assault and is sentenced to 10 years in prison. I said to him, why, if you had done this, why did you, why did you give us your blood sample? And his response was that he thought the whole thing was just gonna blow over. 
In his mind, he hoped it was going to blow over. I was really happy for the sentence, but it still worries me that sometime he could come back. While the community of Meadowvale may now be a safer place, each of the victims still lives with the memories of that night, the memories of the Loch Ness Monster. The stories on 72 Hours are true. The detectives and forensic scientists are the ones who actually worked on the case. The names of the convicted are real. <laughs>